we're gonna do some more work. So you remember probably earlier that I replaced these door cups here. This is just kind of a plastic piece that uh, these break a lot on Mustangs for a few reasons. Uh, one, we'll just say it's not a great design. Okay, uh, that out of the way. Also, when people remove the door panel and then reinstall it, that's frequently done poorly. And that's what's happened in the case of this one here. Uh, I'm pretty sure that at some point they replaced the speakers and also Underneath here, there's kind of a little post that sticks down and it interfaces with a metal uh, kind of strap that is tied to the structure of the door. And that metal part is bent down, so this isn't really interfacing with it. And that means that this is kind of sloppy and loose. And it also means that if you just pull on it, you know, casually, you stand a pretty good chance of breaking off the new tab on it too, which that's less than ideal. Uh, it also means that it's kind of not really a great fit on here. So, we're going to do a number of things all at once today. Uh, we're going to take this door panel off. I don't like taking things off and on and off and on because they're not really made for that. And that's, you know, that ends up just destroying all the little tabs and snaps and everything. Uh, so, I want to try and get everything done all at once on this. So, we're going to take these guys back out again. There's a little kind of part up here where they can be pried from. Uh, I'm going to try and do that carefully. And, and get this thing off of there. And that means probably not holding you here on the camera. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and then we'll take the door panel off. That means we have to take off this little tweeter pod here and the door panel lifts up. And we're going to replace the speakers that are in here. And also, because this is a factory Mach 460 system, I'm not sure how the previous owner had it wired. Uh, those are a unique system. What we're going to do is we're going to rewire that and have everything powered off of the head unit, get rid of the factory amplifiers, and uh, make it sound, I think, in my opinion, a lot better. Now, in terms of the aftermarket head unit, what came in this car is this. So that's an old Pioneer. Um, it's got a flip-down faceplate and a loose bezel, and it does play MP3 CDs. So if you burn MP3s to a CD, that's you know like what we used to do 20 years ago, uh, that would certainly function. Um, but it's, I think, seen better days, and of course there's no Bluetooth or anything like that on it. So uh, this guy here is going away, and we're going to have the, the cheap aftermarket uh, head unit go in its place and power all the speakers directly. We'll see how that works out. Okay, this may look like kind of a mess here, and it, I guess it kind of is, um, but what we have here is these are all the factory plugs because this particular car had the factory amplifier up front as well. This was one of the configurations. Example on my wife's 2002, which has the Mach 460 sound system in it. Uh, it did not have that amplifier down there. Um, it just was powered directly off the head unit. In this case, it does have this little amplifier down here. Uh, my 1994 did not have the Mach 460 sound system, but it still did have that little amplifier down there. And it may be a slightly different amplifier depending on Mach 460 or not. Uh, but in any case, that amplifier, uh, the one in the other car, the one in my 94, it didn't actually have a inverter power supply in it. It was just 12 volt rails, which meant it was really six volt rails, uh, thanks to the way that electricity works. And so it was no better than the amplifier built into a head unit, really. It, it was kind of just, you know, a product of the era in which it was manufactured, but kind of pointless. Uh, so what this represents to me really is like eight pounds of dead weight. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and take that thing out of there and uh, eliminate it, because it has no reason to be there and also eliminate some of this mess of wiring that's in place currently. Well, as you can hopefully see by removing that amplifier from down there, I was also able to eliminate a lot of the wiring harnesses that were in here because those harnesses were just there for that amp. So all that's left is, of course, uh, these here are the ones that interface with the car's electrical system and the speakers. So these guys here are what's going to go ahead and drive the, the loudspeakers and the doors and in the back, and this one here supplies power to the uh, head unit. And one more thing that's kind of cool is we've got this yellow wire down here. Uh, this one here is able to supply relatively high current. I mean, not, you know, like high, high current, but this is the one that was originally there to power that amplifier. And so I can tap into this and use this to supply higher current to uh, the aftermarket head unit, which will make sure that it can work its absolute best. So that doesn't suck. And then this last one down here, this harness is what goes back to those two amplifiers for the mock audio system. And if I want to, I can try to tap into that, um, but I think I have another purpose for that down the road. So we'll have to stay tuned and see if you want to see how it work with that. Now there are some kind of goofy things going on here, like for example, the previous owner broke this part of the dashboard. 
and there's not really a great fix for that. They also broke out uh, part of it up here. Again, not a great fix for that, uh, aside from replacing the dash. Um, I'll see what I can do, though. I mean, it's not like a big deal if I don't fix it, but I'd like to fix it. Uh, and you can see here, there's a screw that's in place back here because someone was uh, not careful with removing this portion of the head unit or the um, you know so support bracket. Uh, and also a couple of the little pins that are made to go in here and here have broken. So uh, we're going to do the best we can with those. It also looks like they used just like some wood screws in here in place of the hardware that originally came out of it. I'm not sure what the deal is with that. Uh, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can with making sure everything works the way that it should. And uh, here is the amplifier. You can see that that's the size of it approximately uh, that came out of there. Um, I don't know, it probably weighs like three pounds, maybe four pounds, uh, as well as all the wiring that was accompanying it uh, that came out of the car. You probably remember from earlier that we've seen a few little wacky things in this car, like the surprise panties that showed up and the weird blue wire that went across the engine. Previous owners are pretty rough on cars. There's a reason we say FPO. And uh, the F does not mean fantastic uh, about the previous owners. But when I opened up this door panel, I saw something kind of unexpected. And that is that earlier I had looked in, just, you know, peeked through the little grill of the speakers, and I saw some like chrome or reflective mylar and I thought, okay, someone put a set of aftermarket speakers in here, no big deal. I'm just going to be replacing all that anyways. And I figured, you know, just some cheap like swap meet six by nines, the kind that have bright, shiny mylar, you know, tweeters and whatever. And then I took off the passenger door card and I saw this. Well, that's, that's the factory speaker. That's not even anything different. Uh, and and so I, I got thinking like what what was chrome like is there something shiny on here that I just somehow was interpreting as chrome like what's going on and Whatever so I figure I'll just take both doors off and work on them both at the same time So I went over to the other side and you know something's coming. So, so let's look at what's going on on the driver's side uh, Yeah, so it's a pioneer. I mean, it's I guess a name brand although it's still the cheap pioneer, but it's a it's a four by six held in with like little bits of galvanized metal, like roofing metal or something. Just kind of randomly, I think this is one of those, uh, they call them like a hurricane brace that they just bent back and forth until it split at the 90 degree angle. And, and that's it, that's, that's the speaker replacement that someone did. And um, I mean, I, I guess I'll, I'll just let you go ahead and make your decision about how you feel about that, but uh, it's definitely something. So thankfully, we have a replacement for this coming. That can go and get retired. Uh, I think you know what that means. Looks like Alaska Airlines. And the other part that I wanted to share from that is on both sides, that handle, that door pocket, wouldn't quite interface with the metal piece that it's supposed to interface with in order to you know, pull the door shut. And I wasn't quite sure what was going on with that because I've had the doors open on this car before to replace a power window regulator and on my wife's car to replace speakers and power window regulator. And so I've seen the inside of these doors before, but not this particular one. I didn't remember what exactly was wrong, missing, whatever. And what it is, is this is the metal part that it's supposed to interface with. There's a little, little kind of tab under here and that's what the, the door cup, the part you actually grab with your hand, interfaces with. And this is just pushed down. So you can see that it should be up here and either riveted or otherwise held in place, probably by this melted plastic you know, rivet that, that they do uh, from the factory. And that's just entirely absent. And that's allowing this to hang way down instead of being up where it belongs. And so that's going to be pretty easy to fix. I think what I might end up doing with that is just um, Actually, I fix it through the door. I'm just going to find a couple of really nice looking finish uh, pieces of hardware to put over this and have it visible through the door. I know that's not as clean as not having it through the door, but I want it to be structural and I'll try to make it as clean as possible and not just look like a couple of deck screws hanging out there. Uh, so I think that'll be a good solution, uh, a permanent fix and solution for it. And that'll allow it to interface with here and this part right here is where a screw comes through and actually screws into the door. Like it's actually structural to the component of the door. So when someone pulls on that with their hand, they'll be interfacing with the actual door, not just with this card here. Uh, so I think that'll be a good solution. Uh, meanwhile, um, you'll notice that these guys here are a little bit bent. There's some little broken snapped parts. 
So I'm just going to try and take a good evaluation like that's snapped off there. Uh, take a good evaluation of what's broken and what I can do to mitigate that as much as possible. Uh, and of course, we're going to go ahead and replace those speakers there. So that'll be, uh, that'll be a fun task. Okay, with these things out, uh, I've got this wire here. Now this goes back to the other door. So this actually connects over to the other, the passenger side door and is in parallel with the speaker that's over there. And then that also goes back to one of the two amplifiers that's in the back in the trunk area. Uh, but this is not going to get used. This is actually going away. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this wire right here, which feeds just into this little lower bracket portion of the tweeter assembly. I'm going to tie into this wire right here and I'm going to bring some of this down here to the new speakers that are going to live down in this door and then also the other side of it is going to go back up and tie into the new tweeters that are going to live up here. So you'll see how all that stuff works in a moment but the first thing that I have to do is install some Noiko and uh, Noiko is just a brand name it's a sound deadener product and that's going to make it so that the speaker sounds better and it's also going to make it so even when the stereo is turned off the car sounds better. So what do I mean by this? The car sounds better. Uh, when you're driving down the road, you're just, you know, the wind that you're driving past and the rumble from the tires and all that stuff, uh, not only do you hear that directly just coming off the tires and off the wind and everything, and of course any whistling that gets through the weather seals and, and all that stuff, but also that rumble is energizing every panel of the car. So if I tap on the outside of the body here, you can tell that that has a particular sound. It's not just the sound of my fingertips, but there's also kind of that metallic ring that occurs after it. And that ring is hysteresis. Hysteresis just means something that kind of persists after it's no longer receiving any input. It sort of, you know, it, it self-energizes. And when you ring a bell or hit a tuning fork, that's hysteresis. That's, you know, that's, that's it continuing to persist to have energy for some period of time. And so when you're driving down the road, all the rumbling any kind of noise that gets imparted on any of the car, it rings, it persists. And since the input is continuous, it just builds and gets louder. And you know, up to a certain equilibrium, it gets, continues to get louder. So the way that you help to make the car sound quieter and the way that modern cars are a lot quieter inside than older cars is that they have sound deadening material. Now there is some sound deadening material in this car already, like under the carpet, there's uh, sound deadening mats in the trunk. There's a little bit of sound deadening, but not a ton of it. And uh, part of that is a cost thing. They don't want to spend more money than they have to. The you know, material's not free. And part of it is a weight thing. They don't want to add more weight to the car than what's necessary because every ounce they add to it reduces its performance and fuel efficiency. And so I understand why some engineering and cost cutting measures were taken, but I'm going to go ahead and undo some of those cost cutting measures. That's part of the process of making a car your own or making a machine work the way you want it to. I'm going to trade, I'm going to put a couple extra pounds back into the car, but they're going to do what I want them to do, which is to reduce the sound of road noise and the, reduce the sound of rumbling and wind noise and, and stuff like that, and also improve the tightness of the bass because the speaker is also imparting energy on that. And if the speaker's vibration causes the door panel to vibrate, well, that makes the sound less clear. It makes it so your bass loses some of its impact. It kind of smears it across time which is muddy sounding. We, we describe that typically as muddy bass. It's, it reduces the clarity of it. So uh, we're going to go ahead and put sound deadening material inside the door and around the speaker area. Um, it's not super surgical. Uh, really, you know, the, the first like 20% of it does 80% of the work. It kind of follows that 80-20 rule that you're probably familiar with from other parts of life. Uh, so the first, you know, little bit that you put down really does the, the most of the work. And you can put down as much as you want, and it keeps, of course, doing more, but really, but really just starting produces the biggest effect. So where am I going to put it? Well, there's not much really we have access to, right? Like I can peel this back and there's some kind of open areas in here, but I don't necessarily want to peel this plastic since this plastic is still in good condition. I don't actually want to damage it. I don't want to damage the, the seal that's around it. Um, really, I think that would end up being a worse thing for me than dealing with a little bit of noise from not being able to get way back in here. But I can get in a little bit here. So the first thing I'm going to do is clean all of this because you can see there's 
quite a lot of dust built up in there. Uh, so I'm going to clean what I can inside here. There's a bar here. This is like your side impact bar. This is so if you get you know in a collision, this helps to prevent the the car that crashes into you from you know breaking your leg and and injuring you. Uh, and so this isn't really part of the sound deadening process that has almost no resonance to it. But the bracketry that it connects to imparts a lot of energy on the door. And of course the flat part back there, you can see, well that's the outer skin of the car. And I can get access to quite a bit of it up here. So I can just reach my arm in and get as much as I can of it, uh, both first with cleaning and second with applying strips of that noise deadener. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and put that all in there. I'm also going to apply some around here. Applying some directly around where the speaker is has kind of an enhancing effect on that. Even though the place where the speaker is physically mounted isn't going to really ring, it's not a panel of metal that has that high resonance to it, but mounting it as close to the speaker as possible does what's called mass loading. It's a very loud airplane. Installing a bunch of Noiko as close as possible to the speaker and to the speaker bracket itself affects what's called mass loading. And mass loading changes the ratio between the moving part of the speaker, meaning the motor and the cone, versus the basket and the rest of, you know, what's rigid to the speaker. And that just means that more of the energy that gets put into the cone actually gets put into the cone. You know that every action has an equal and opposite reaction, right? So when the motor is pushing the cone out, it's also pushing the basket back. And if you mass load it, if you give it a lot of mass against which to push, then more of that energy gets imparted into the cone. It's, it's just, you know, like pushing against a hard surface versus pushing against a kind of softer surface. And so mass loading reduces the amount of vibrations that get imparted into the door in the first place and also improves the efficiency of the speaker as installed. So that means that you get a bit more sound per watt. It also means that the sound you hear is cleaner. And as a kind of bonus effect, it can also serve as a bit of a gasket, and that allows you to keep more of the, the back waves, you know, the waves coming off the back of the speaker, in the door versus sneaking around front and interacting with the waves that are on the front of the speaker, which is almost always a bad thing. So uh, I'm going to get to work on cleaning this, and we'll get all the wiring stuff taken care of, and then I'll show you what it looks like when we're done. Uh, I apologize, I'm not going to just continuously video the entire thing because uh, there's not much to really see there.
entertained by music when they hit you feel no pain like folks that controls your brain okay the door woofers are in place uh, so that's uh, in there nice and tight uh, this is all screwed down and, and used existing screw holes so there was no butchery that had to take place uh, these guys here the wires come up and I soldered them inside of this connector after depinning the connector using some depinning keys you should have these if you work on cars uh, so I depinned the connector soldered on made sure I had the polarity correct of course and so that's just connected in there nice and neat and then of course the tweeter pod is going to go up on top of it here once the door panel is in place I've got the tweeters mounted in there, just the MTX audio uh, tweeters. These are not actually the tweeters that go with those speakers, but that's a story for another day. Anyways, um, so those are in there, nice and tight and in place. I put a little felt around the front of it uh, just to kind of improve the sound a little and also to obscure the, the kind of bracketry that I had to put behind this. The crossover for that tweeter is also mounted up inside there. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but it was a tight fit and uh, thankfully it fit inside there so that means I get to use the existing wiring just clip right in there and uh, that'll be nice for these panels here which fit inside there and hopefully you can see that for these panels I wasn't able to get this hook here to interface with the metal part that's back there and uh, that was this piece in particular it's supposed to just fit into that slot and that gives it a mechanical pull it's tied into this screw right here, which connects to the physical metal structure of the door so that when you pull on the handle, you're pulling on here. However, this was flappy. And the reason for that is back here, the original manufacturing uh, just had it connected with some of these smashed down melted plastic pieces. And of course they broke uh, when someone was removing the door panel, I would imagine, because you do have to pull pretty hard to break those. So I, I think someone just was violent with it, uh, which meant that this was just dangling. This metal piece was not interfacing in the right place. So as a solution, uh, it may not be the prettiest thing in the world, but remember the point of this car isn't to make it concours perfect. It's just to make it a very nice car. I got some quarter inch uh, screws with nylock nuts. Those nylock nuts are not going to back out on their own and I drilled a couple of holes in the panel and so now we have this hardware here. Now I used stainless steel and I used uh, finish washers to make it look as as close to elegant as it could and uh, of course this doesn't precisely follow that contour but that's that's where the holes wear so I had to go with where the holes already wear. Uh, I don't think it's going to look that bad I think it'll be alright and it's a permanent solution so you know um, like I said it's not meant to be concourse perfect with stuff like this it never will be but it certainly is going to make it functional and, and not too inelegant. Cool. So this is still a little bit flappity because there's some broken tabs on it and that's just uh, from the previous owner and you know the quarter century of existing that this thing's done. I hope I can at some point address that because that's going to bother me and this is going to bother me. We'll, we'll see what goes on with that. But for now, we've got a Bluetooth radio in here. It's playing Bluetooth uh, off of the internet. So this is some John Vault and the Evil Robots, uh, just on shuffle. And so that's on, uh, that's, that's all in place. This should work correctly. And over here, we've got the loudspeakers down there in the doors, of course. And then up here, we've got the tweeters. And I've got the little felt around here to just kind of uh, hope to, to make sure it minimizes reflections in there and sounds as good as it can. And the next thing is, I got these, which are machined billet uh, covers. So hopefully these go on there and snap on nicely. I really hope they do. All right, that's gonna probably be a two-handed job. <laughs>
Okay, yeah, that was absolutely a two-handed job, but now we've got the little speaker pods here in a stainless steel that's gonna reflect the sun directly in my eye. Actually, I'm sorry, machined aluminum, uh, machined billet aluminum. So that'll probably get hotter than Hades during the, uh, the summer when the sun's shining on it. Uh, you can see the little MTX audio through there, which is kind of cool. It's nice to be able to see it. Hopefully the camera is getting you the right angle on that to see it. A little peekaboo. Now this being the internet, I could tell you that this sounds fantastic, but of course I could say anything, right? It does in fact sound a lot better than it did. It sounds pretty good. I still have to work on the back there. The back speakers are, are not really doing what they're gonna end up needing to do, but I haven't touched it back there yet. Uh, we'll see that in a future video. But realistically, this is the least good sounding stereo in, in my personal fleet because this is the one I've put the least money into. Uh, this is a head unit that I had lying around, a, you know, inexpensive one from Power Acoustic, which is inexpensive, but it has Bluetooth, you know, and it has a CD player if I want to use a CD on it. Um, it has a screen, but not a touch screen, which is a little weird in 2022, but like I said, it was very inexpensive. I've got the component speakers up front being played off the head unit. Uh, for all practical intents, the Mach 460 stuff is no longer present in here. So with this done, I'm going to change into some clothes that are a bit more appropriate for going to the lake, and we're going to cruise up to the lake and use this car for exactly the thing I envisioned it for, which is going to the lake. You know, that, that's why it's called the Rum Runner. It's, it's meant to be kind of a lighthearted, just runabout, you know, have a good time car. And so we're going to do exactly that. I'm um, just going to have a little bit better music than last time. Uh, hopefully it's going to sound a little bit better both from the dual exhaust that's on it now as well as from the you know noise deadening that's inside the doors. And I've got a lot more noise deadening to install in other places throughout the car later on, but this is what I've got so far. Now this is the part in the video where I usually ask, hey, so you've seen all the work I've done so far since I got the car, uh, and you know what do you think the value of the car is now? Not because I'm trying to sell it, I'm trying to just kind of you know participate in this little like, let's see, if adding effort to a car, you know, raises its value, makes it worth more. So now this car, um, kind of to give you a recap, I got it for a very low price with an awful lot wrong with it and very filthy. Um, I did stuff like added a back seat to it that it didn't have. I cleaned the, the front seat. Now these seats are still gross. They've still got, you know, a cigarette burn right there and, and the driver's seat is worse, but they're clean at least. So you're not gonna get a booty disease from just sitting in them. I replaced the center console because the old console was disgusting and broken and didn't have cup holders. So I put a newer one in that I, I painted to match the car with proper paint. The, this, is, this paint isn't going to come off anytime soon. Uh, you know, and it's not going to start looking crappy because it's not just regular spray paint. It's paint specifically for this type of material. Uh, so this here is a, a nicer, more modern center console. I replaced a lot of just janky stuff that was around there. Replaced the shift knob. Uh, now we've got a more modern radio that's got a USB port on it and Bluetooth, and so that's kind of cool. Uh, we replaced the front speakers that were terrible with uh, something that's pretty awesome now, and a little bit of sound deadening. So I've got all that done, and of course I also replaced the valve stem seals that were inside the engine so that the engine doesn't smoke anymore. Uh, replaced the oxygen sensors because they were ancient. Put a brand new starter on the car put a new set of wheels that are more befitting the car, as well as a new set of four matching tires instead of the random stuff that was on there previously. Uh, replaced the headlights with new headlights and corrected a bunch of wiring issues. And you saw that I did the wiring with professionalism and care. I didn't just, you know, crimp and clip. Everything is done very cleanly. Uh, cleaned up a lot of wiring under the hood, of course. Replaced all the shock absorbers with new shocks. I put a new windshield in the car and a dual exhaust, a true dual exhaust that's still emissions compliant. It has all four catalytic converters, but behind the catalytic converters, it goes out through an H pipe and then out to a couple of Flowmaster 50 series mufflers and dual exits. I haven't yet done testing to see how much faster it might be. Uh, I can tell you that it sounds a lot more like a sporty car. It's not loud. Um, the, the Flowmaster 50s are resonated exhausts, so they're not nearly as loud as like a 40 or 44 series or a 10 series. So it's quiet, it cruises quietly, but it has a little bit more drama, you know, a little bit more excitement, which I think is kind of cool. And visually, I think the dual exhausts look cooler because it's a combustion car. It's never going to not be a combustion car. So, it, you know, the dual exhausts kind of, you know, illustrate that, that you know, conventional sporty nature about it. Uh, and I believe it's probably uncorked a little bit of extra power, and that'll become not only apparent when I take it out on the highway, 
but also much more apparent when I've replaced the rear end gears, and that's coming up in the future. This is getting a different axle gear ratio to improve acceleration and also take advantage of some changes that are going to be taking place, both with the exhaust that's already done and underneath the hood. So I hope you look forward to that stuff in the future. If you could, let me know what you think the car is worth at this time. It's a 96 Mustang with all the stuff that I just described, 138,000 miles on it. And yes, the cluster is working correctly. Uh, it works very well, and I believe it would pass emissions in all 50 states. Uh, it's not smoking, not burning oil, not leaking very much oil. The rear main seal does have a tiny drip, which is to be expected of a car that's over a quarter century old. Um, so yeah, well, let me know what you think the car is worth. Again, I'm not trying to sell it. I'm trying to see how working on a car improves its value and if it's something where people are gonna go, ah, it's still a V6 Mustang, it still sucks. Or if they're gonna say, you know what, that actually looks like a pretty cool car, I would, I would drive that. So let me know what you think and if you appreciate this kind of content, of course, click that subscribe button. You know I gotta ask. I hope you're having a great day.